This morning, we're going to pray before we enter into worship. If you want to join me in just extending your hands out this morning, just in a posture of receiving. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you're already in the room, Lord. And our hope and our prayer today is that your name would be exalted in this place, in our living rooms all across the city of Calgary. So we come boldly into your presence this morning.
bringing you our praise and our worship and our dancing and our celebration, Lord. And everybody says, amen, church. Let's worship together.
church, let's make this our prayer. Chains will fall, prisons shake at the sound of Jesus' name. And lives made whole, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. teach you a new song this morning church so the words will be up on the screen but just let this song sink in deep to your hearts this morning
When the rain fell, when the floods came, when the wind blew, I was okay. You were right there. You're in every step I take. When the night falls, when my heart aches, if I stumble, I will not break. You'll be right there. You're in every step I take. Sing that over you this morning. When the rain fell, when the floods came, when the wind front to back, those sitting in their living rooms. If you feel distant from God and you're just longing to feel his nearness, he is with you, he is for you. Just even as an act of faith this morning, if you feel comfortable just putting your hands out in front of you, we're gonna sing this chorus again. And it says that the words of life or death are in our tongue. And I believe that there's power in the words that we declare. And we're gonna sing that our Father is for us and that he is near to us. And we're gonna sing it until we believe it this morning, church, because we will not give in to fear. We will not give in to fear, but we will step out by faith and declare that our Father is a God who draws near to his sons and daughters. Amen? So Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that you're already in the room, Lord. And for those of my friends this morning that feel that you are distant, I pray right now by your Holy Spirit that you would draw near, that you would draw near, that you would draw near, that you would draw near. As we declare this song, as we sing these words, Lord, that you would draw near to every heart. You are with me. And you are with me. Father, you're full. And fear will never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus I'm never alone I'm never abandoned Or fear will never conquer me Cause I belong to Jesus You are with me And you are with me And Father you're full 
And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Father, we call one more time. Father. Father, we call on your name. Your name revealed by the word of your son. Emmanuel, God with us saves. In your spirit invites us to come. Let heaven and earth join in one song, a chorus of hope. Let heaven, let heaven and earth join in one song, a chorus of hope. Let the world sing a new song. Let the world sing a new song. kingdom that conquers through love that heaven and earth join in one song a chorus of hope that heaven and earth that heaven and earth join in one song a chorus of hope let the world sing
join together and sing hallelujah. Just lift your voices. going to sing this ancient prayer just says come Lord Jesus a song that the church has been singing for hundreds of years together last few thousand years for sure come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come Lord Jesus come we sing it over our nation this morning. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. You are our King, our Savior, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Keep singing.
make that our prayer this morning. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Just sing one more time. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, come, Holy Spirit. Come. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Scripture says that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. And our heart cry this morning as we are praying is, come Holy Spirit. We want your presence. Come Lord Jesus. We desire your presence. We desire you in our lives. We desire to know you more. As we pray a bold prayer like that, we can be assured that as we say, come Lord Jesus, that he is not only able, but he is willing to come and to meet us in every place that you may find yourself today, whatever burden it is, whatever challenge. And as we pray, we say, come Holy Spirit into the brokenness of my own life. Come Holy Spirit into the broken relationships that are happening around me. Come Holy Spirit into my physical body to bring healing, and health. How many believe that God is still a healer today? Come Holy Spirit to touch my mind and to transform my mind so that my mind is healthy and it's it's not racing with fear and depression and anxiety and pain. He's our healer. He comes to heal us. And as we've gathered together in this place, there's a, a corporate prayer. There's a a a collective prayer that we are praying together come Holy Spirit but I want you to know friend that as you welcome him that he is as close to you as your very breath as you breathe in his life he is here to touch you and heal you and help you today and so I would invite you today wherever you are to lift your hands to the Lord in a place of receiving and surrender if you would like to do that or as you stand in this moment to to do something to gesture your need for God today and so father you see our hearts and our lives and our hands raised to you and we do pray that prayer we say come Holy Spirit come Spirit of Jesus comforter teacher we say come Holy Spirit Come as oil, come as fire, come as wind. Lord, come as as healer and deliverer, the one who sets us free today. Come as restorer, as healer and helper. Come into our lives fresh and anew today, Lord Jesus. We welcome you in this house. We welcome you in this temple, in our lives personally today. Come, Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you that you are healing people now. You are healing and setting free from bondages and brokenness. And if there's a need physically in your body or whether it's a a physical or an emotional or a mental health need, I would encourage you to raise your hands to the Lord and in these moments let's pray for his power and his deliverance to touch and set us free. Thank you Lord. You see right now in this place Father we're reaching out in faith And together as we agree together in the name of Jesus and in faith, we speak healing and health now to everybody. We speak healing and deliverance. Lord, where there's been bondage and brokenness, we thank you that you are setting your people free today and even now in this place. Father, we pray you would fill our lives fresh today with you. I would just encourage you to just begin to worship him in your own way. Just begin to lift your voice to him today. To pray in the spirit and with understanding. To call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says call upon his name and you will be saved. So Father, we call upon your name. We thank you, Lord, now in the name of Jesus for your power, for your presence, for your freedom, for your liberty, for the power of God flowing in this room, touching and healing and transforming today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. So Father, now as we, as we continue to focus our, our lives and our hearts and our affection on you, we pray, Lord, that you would have your way. We thank you we can leave 
these heavy burdens with you. We thank you that you are setting us free. We love you, Lord. And the church said amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be in church, everyone. Welcome back. So many people coming back today. In the first service, I saw a number of people I haven't seen for a while. And, you know, every once in a while, I'll be around town, you know, at Costco or wherever I bump into you and grocery store or whatever. And, and often some of you will say, Pastor, we haven't come back yet since COVID, but we're watching online. So we appreciate that. And that's great. But it's so good to see so many of you uh, re-engaging back at church today. And why don't you turn and find somebody, give them a, a little fist bump, a smile, say hi to somebody before you're seated. Welcome them to church. Well, I hope you're encouraged today. I hope you feel the joy that's in this place, the joy of the Lord. There's something great about being together, isn't there? So, so great to have you. If you're new to church, we want to welcome you. Let's just welcome everybody who's new or coming back to church. Let's just welcome you here this morning. Thanks for being here. And I don't want to forget about you watching online. We have several hundred people every week just join us online from around the world. So wherever you're joining us from today online, we welcome you as well. And we feel uh, so privileged that you've joined us. If you are new to church today, we have what is called Next Steps. And they've moved it on me. It used to be outside these doors, but right now it is just over in this corner, uh, just on the way out the doors heading north of the building. Stop by and, and get connected. A host uh, will be there to, to meet you and help you find a place to take your next steps or just learn more about this faith community. We'd love to get to know your name. So do that today if you're new or newer and you want to get connected. After the service today, one o'clock, there is a membership information meeting, a membership meeting. And so you can join us in the chapel. Um, you say, well, did I have to sign up in advance? Uh, the good news is Pastor Cliff told me you don't have to. You can just join the meeting at one o'clock. So uh, please, please join us back there and we'd love to help you take some steps uh, let you know a little bit more about being a part of this community as a member. Also today, we have uh, some things to celebrate where we have a uh, worship, live worship recording that's coming up in two weeks, right, Michael? So this is gonna be good. Have you ever wanted to be on an album? See, you can be on this album. So if you come in two weeks' time, we're gonna be having church just like this, so there'll be nothing really too different. We'll have maybe some extra microphones and a few things around. But it's going to be a time where we uh, celebrate together. God's really given the, the team and, and us some new songs to sing uh, throughout this last couple of years. And we want to share it uh, with the world. And so come be a part of that. And I know it'll be a blessing to you and I know a blessing to many around, around the globe uh, as they continue to encounter Jesus. Well, today we want to pause to receive our tithes and our offerings. And I know many of you have given already online or automatically, but some are prepared to give in this moment. But... Nevertheless, we're going to pause and we're going to pray. And we thank you for your continued giving. It's just amazing to me. Over these last couple of years, it's been very volatile. But I want to thank you, First Assembly, uh, for your faithful giving. And as you've been able to give, we have done so much here in Calgary and around the world to just get the gospel out and to love people to Jesus and to meet needs practically in our city, city and spiritually. And so we have not slowed down on mission. That's what I loved about it. The church cannot be canceled. <laughs> we, we just adjusted and we just kept moving forward. And you've been a big part of that by your faithfulness and your contribution and your giving to the Lord as worship. So let's pause and let's pray. And then we'll, we'll give. There's several ways that you can give on the screen behind you. Father, we thank you again for your blessing, for your goodness. And we recognize that everything that we have is from you. The very breath that we are breathing is a gift. And so, Lord, we worship you today with our giving, recognizing that you are our provider. And Lord, according to your words, we sow our first fruits, our first fruits into your kingdom. And Lord, into the work that you've called us to participate in. I thank you, Lord, that as we do that, that supernaturally something is released. Lord, there's a kingdom blessing that comes with that in our lives 
and also that blesses the body of Christ to continue to be on mission here in Calgary and around the world. I pray, Lord, that you would meet every need. You would provide jobs and employment for those who are searching. And God, you've been so good to us. So we sow today by faith and in worship because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you as you give. Well, I think that's, I think that's it. I tried to shorten it up a little bit because we've got a great word today by Pastor Cliff as we finish our series we've called Altars. And so we're gonna welcome uh, our very own, oh, Pastor Cliff, but before we do, but before we do, thank you, Mark. Look at that. Mark and Kirsten, come on up here. Please come up here. We want to pray for you. I missed my cue, and so thank you, Mark, for waving me down. This is Kirsten and Mark, and Kirsten, many of you may have met her over COVID. Some of you may not have had the chance to, but she came on our team just over a year ago. Um, and she was overseeing our FA Cares ministry. And really, thank you, Kirsten, for your great work. Really got that moving. But even before um, she joined our team, she had a real burden for missions. And it was something she shared with me and the team. And, and now God has opened up a door for you that we're excited to get behind and pray for you. So why don't you tell us what's going on? Thank you so much, Pastor Ben. And thank you, church family. We are so excited to go to La Esperanza Honduras um, just to minister to the youth in that region, really to bring significance and identity to their lives. So Marg and I will be um, Bible teaching, and I'll be teaching the teachers, and just getting the kids engaged, um, and just for that, them to know the love of Jesus. So I'm the older woman from Titus 2, and men encouraging the younger woman to follow her heart, in Jesus' name. Amen. And Kirsten, you, just tell us a little bit too. You said this was a burden that you felt many years ago and, and just give us a little bit more and then we wanna pray for you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I lived in Honduras in my 20s, so about 20 years ago. And ever since then, I've had such a heart for the people of Honduras. The kids, I was a teacher down there for a year. And so it's been a journey to get back there, but I feel the time is right and God is calling me. So yeah, I'm very excited. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, we wanna pray for... Kirsten and Marg, and we're going to be uh, getting behind Kirsten with our Kingdom Builders focus this year, which is great. And you know, this is the first short-term missions team that we've sent out for over two years. So this is kind of exciting. We, uh, because of travel and all the uncertainties, but we're going to bless you as you guys go. And so let's, let's pray for them together. Father, we thank you for Kirsten and for Marg. We pray, God, that you would grace them to fulfill what it is you've put in their heart, Lord, that the gospel would go forward. We claim souls and salvation. We pray, Lord, for the supernatural release of your spirit to work in them and through them, Lord, to see many people come to know you. We thank you for this burden that's been on Kirsten's heart, and we bless her as she takes these steps of faith, and we pray for Marg and Kirsten that they would uh, represent you so well, lift up your name, Lord, and that so much fruit would take place for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Bless you. Wonderful. Well, this is good. This is really good. Well, now, now I'm calling on Pastor Cliff. There he is. I looked at the front row, Cliff, and I didn't see you, but here you are coming in from the side. Let's just show our appreciation this morning to Pastor Cliff as he brings the word. Thank you so much. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, come. Father of glory, we thank you for our bodies this day. We thank you that you have chosen us you have chosen us on purpose, with purpose, for purpose, and for your eternal plan to come to fruition. We thank you for each other today. We thank you for that body that is named by the body of Christ. 
with grace each other today in your presence, in your glory. Father us in your glory, Father of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You guys are awesome. Aren't they great? Man, I tell you, we're so very, very blessed with the gifts of the Spirit in this house. Amen? We have no reason to be unhealthy. <laughs> we, we, we are flourishing in the gifts. Well, it's my honor and privilege, thank you, Pastor Ben, to conclude our series on altars. And um, there's been some wonderful teaching, wonderful motivational preaching uh, for us to be in relationship with Jesus. Amen? Amen? To be in relationship with Jesus. And to be in relationship with Jesus is to be in relationship with yourself and to be in relationship with others. Because it's, all, it's an all-inclusive work of the Holy Spirit. So thank you, those of you who have been sharing on this theme. And I think Pastor Ben has got a, another theme coming. And so uh, we're going to conclude this one today. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I want to start by saying that my title today is The Ultimate Altar. The Ultimate Altar. And you know who he is, right? He's Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate altar. Altar. He's the realization of all worship and all altars and all devotion to God. He is the realization of that. And us, his body, you and me, we are the inauguration of the eschatological plan of God. That's like saying we are the new creation. That's a simpler way to put it. Altars. There was a movie called Altars of the World, a 1976 American documentary film. It was created as a shorter version of the 55 American documentary, Altars of the East. Altars of the World was the last recipient of the Golden Globe Award for Best Documentary Film before the award was retired in 1977. So there's even a movie on altars. Let's try this again, Justin. Now, some altars are layered. There it is. Oh, oh, this is a little better than the first service. I'll let, that, let you look at that for a while. Some altars are layered, and the only way to the top, to the summit, is to do it together. If you do it by yourself, it's a lonely place to be, and there's nothing there but thin air. <laughs> yeah. I guess I've been married too long. I don't know. <laughs> what is an altar? An altar in its simplest form is a place of sacrifice and a PowerPoint to draw spiritual energy and supernatural strength. When I say that, I don't mean physically, I mean spiritually. Altars are places of separation, where we separate ourselves to God and separate ourselves from curses and generational sins. An altar is a raised area in a house of worship where people can honor God with offerings, which first and foremost is the offering of of yourself is prominent in the Bible as we've been hearing in the last few Sundays. It's referred to as God's table, a sacred place for sacrifices, a place of encounter as we have heard so often in this series. An altar with two steps represents the earth and sky. With three steps, the altar depicts purgatory, or earth, or heaven, or as some would say, it pictures the Holy Trinity. The Tower of Babel was an altar. Ziggurats, they're called. And these were built often not 
so much to ascend to God, but for the gods to descend. They're an ancient Near Eastern mindset of having the gods descend. They are often built besides temples of worship for the gods to come and enter into the temple to receive the people's worship. That altar, if you will, was not the problem. I mean, I don't know what you would think of that, but the motive behind that altar was the problem. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And so they built what we know as the Tower of Babel. Altars in and of themselves are amoral. Our motive for making them sometimes is not. In the tabernacle and afterwards in the temple, only two altars are mentioned, the altar of burnt offering and the altar of incense. I want you to know that you are the incense to God. Amen? You're the sweet aroma to God. You're the burning one. You're the burning one. You are the incense, the fragrant aroma of God reflecting back to God. Jesus is the fragrant aroma in you and in me. That's amazing. I think you should clap for that one. Our churches even reflect the altar because they're built around the altar. The narthex is an architectural element typical of early Christian and Byzantine basilicas and churches consisting of an entrance or a lobby area located at the west end of the nave opposite the church's main altar. By extension, the narthex or the lobby, if you will, was a place devoted as a covering to the entrance to the altar. The Lord's table, therefore, plays a very important role in the celebration of Holy Communion, which is also known as the Eucharist or the Mass. The Lord's table is the place where we meet with him. The Lord's table is the place where we remember him, where we are reminded of the great price that he paid in laying down his life for us. It's a wonderful place. We celebrate that. We come to the communion table. And Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. Take this in remembrance of me. And then you enjoy the message last Sunday by Cody on remembering or not forgetting. or I can't remember what the title was, something about amnesia. (laughs) But it was about remembering. And Jesus said, you have a tendency to forget, so do this in remembrance of me. So it plays a great role in our worship. The Pharisees held the altar at a very high esteem. They saw the altar as center to everything, and when they entered into some kind of an agreement with somebody or a vow was to be made, they would swear by the altar. And sometimes that wasn't enough, so then they would swear by the gold of the altar. And when Jesus showed up, he just said, stop it. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Yeah, the scriptures teach us to present our gift at the altar as an act of worship. And if you're at odds, it says with someone, leave your gift there, go make it right, and then come back and present your offering that you laid on the altar. The world religions have been built around altars. Sometimes they have been used to sacrifice human beings. And there's a time in God's people's history when they sacrificed their children on altars to Molech. And they were more about death than they were about life. You know, even Nazism was built on Hitler's altar called Mein Kampf or My Struggle. And many, many people died on that altar. Altars are Kairos moments to redeem Kronos time. Most altars are born from a deep existential need for the other. There's something in us that we long for that this world doesn't provide. It comes from a deep sense that we have lost something, from a deep sense that the world is not as it should be, and I am not as I should be. 
But often our attempts at a solution is motivated from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the solution often presents us with both good and evil. We're living in very interesting times, aren't we? The cultures of the world are clashing. They're clashing. And people are deciding what's right and what's wrong. And their attempts at a solution often, although their intention is good, often ends up in something that is destructive. We chose our wisdom over God's. So you might say, well, Cliff, you know, what's your text? By the way, I'm wearing my, wearing my mask. <laughs> well, my text is from Romans 12, 1 and 2. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's your worship, presenting your body. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, In my notes, I've got some other scriptures that I want to read, and I call this an illuminating scripture to the text that I just read. This text illuminates and interprets that scripture we just read. It's 2 Corinthians 6, 1 to 13. I'll read it very quickly because you can visit it later. In a favorable time I listened to you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as imposters and yet are true as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Open your heart. And then in 522 of the same chapters in Corinthians, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. You are an ambassador. I am an ambassador. God, through us, is making his appeal to the world. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He loves you, he's for you, he has nothing but good for you, and your life will be fuller and more meaningful and filled with purpose, and if that weren't enough, he's got a great plan that he's unfolding for your life. Be reconciled to God. That's the voice of the church. That's the voice of the body. That's what we are saying to the world. And we lay down our lives. Now, when I read those scriptures, I thought for the moment, I hope that was just for then, Pastor Ben, that that was just for Paul and his ragtag team, that we don't have to go through those things. But you know what? Loving your neighbor can get you crucified. But it's okay. Because we're presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice because there's something greater. There's a greater purpose. There's a greater plan. There's something unfolding that the world or the mind of man can fully comprehend. And it's coming, and we're the first fruits of it. Amen? 
Then I put together an illustrative statement. You see, I'm trying to sound like a scholar. You know, Cody is up here, and I enjoy his teaching, and he comes across like some scholar who has been steeped and bathed and washed again and again and again in the Word. And so I thought, you know, I got to... I got to try to copy that a little bit. <laughs> so I got this illustrative statement, and this is how it goes. The cross of humility, note, humility is not something done to you. Something done to you is humiliation. The cross of humility, the humility is something I choose. I humble myself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. And it's not like God is going, oh, there he is, oh, there he is, oh, I better get him under my hand. No, 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 you come under and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, what does he do? You don't know this? You should know this. He raises you up, which simply means he gives you favor. He puts you in a place of influence and impact. But you see, it, it, it's the prerequisite is humility. So the, here's my illustrative statement, Cody. The cross of humility is where goodness and evil intersect with love and death is overcome with life. God used the altar of death to bring forth life. He does not ask when, he, when he, that life rises from death, he does not ask a righteousness question, are you good enough? Because you'll never be good enough. The altar is not a place to go to be good enough. An altar is a place where you go to meet with God and God with you, and you agree to do something together. Amen? We don't go back laying a foundation of repentance, of good works, and all this stuff, and the elementary stuff of Christ. We move on to maturity. And so he does not ask a righteousness question. And of course, we know this question, because he asked it of Peter, who had failed. He asked a relational question. Do you love me? You see, my relationship with God is inspired by love, is lived out by love, and is given away by love. Will you go serve? Will you go lay your life down? Will you feed my sheep? Will you go to the masses and tell them about this love? All righteousness has been fulfilled in Christ. You see, it is mercy and grace Kissing the world with the love of God. What's that song we used to sing, Michael? Where are you? That sloppy kiss one? (laughs) What is that song with the sloppy kiss? Yes. How he loves. And you know it is sloppy. (laughs) Wet ones are some of the best ones. Anyway. Mercy and grace, kissing the world with the love of God. That's a living sacrifice. That's the sacrifice we've been called to. The grace of Christ in this world is a bit of a hard sell. I know it. I know that it is because it requires a deflation of the ego. It required a deflation of my ego. I had to humble myself. I had to admit that I needed a savior, that I couldn't save myself, that I couldn't truly own my body and be in my body fully alive without him. I had to humble myself. It required a deflation of the ego. And there's still some times where it kind of goes... Like that balloon when the air goes out of it. That's the challenge that we have in bringing our message to the world. It's called self-righteousness. And sometimes our altars can be used to inflate the ego rather than deflate it. You see, we've been hearing some good teaching out of the Old Testament about altars. And in the Old Testament, it was, you're on holy ground. Take your shoes off. Take off your work boots. 
Take off your sandals. You're on holy ground. But in the New Testament, the message is put on your shoes. Put on the shoes. Shod your feet with the gospel of peace. Put your shoes on. Go make sacred space because you are sacred. You are the moving tabernacle of God's presence. You know, our gathering on Sundays at the end of the week, which is really the start of the week, our gatherings is just one of the mobile things that the body of Christ does. There's so much more. As somebody once said, this is the most obvious thing we do. Take off your shoes. No, put your shoes on. Go make sacred space. In Romans 12, 1 to 2, present I appeal to you. It's a word that is used repeatedly in Paul's writings. 1 Corinthians, or by the name of. 1 Corinthians 1.10, or I entreat you, 2 Corinthians 10.1. Or another place it says, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. Here it says, by the mercies of God, I make this appeal. I appeal to you in light of the mercies of God. I'm making this appeal to you. It's not a law. It's not a commandment. It's not some vow that you make. It is literally an appeal in light of God's mercy. Do you know that God is merciful? Say to yourself, because I'm in this chair, is a testimony that God is merciful. Because if he wasn't merciful, we wouldn't be here. Mercy is... He gives us what we don't deserve. Amen. Amen? He could have said to Adam and Eve, that's it. I've got millions of planets that I can go work on and turn them into another earth space and I can start all over again. The mercies of God are new every morning. If you didn't work with it the day before, they're new every morning. You can get up in the morning and you can say it's a new day and it's a new start. And the past, the yesterdays are over. There's no hope for the past. There's only hope for the future. Amen. It's an appeal. Another place Paul uses the word urge or urgency. Another place in Ephesians 4, 1, he says that you would walk in a manner worthy of the call. You're called. You know what? You're called. You're called. You're not only called, you're justified. Past tense. You're not only justified, you're sanctified. Past tense. You're not only sanctified, you're glorified. Past tense. That's what he's done in Christ. Our theology is often too much shaped and formed around a sin problem, a sin problem that's been resolved. I appeal to you by the mercies of God. So what do we do? We present our bodies. In light of God's mercy, we present our bodies. Not our soul, it doesn't say our soul, doesn't say our spirit, it says our bodies. Because when you present your body, that's all you have for your spirit and your soul is your body. It's all inclusive when he says present your body. And you present it as a righteousness offering. Not for sin, only one ever could do that. But you present your body as a righteousness offering because you have been made righteous in him. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Present your righteousness yourself. Present your body to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. Romans 6.13. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. Peter, 1 Peter 2, 5. You yourselves are living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You, my friend, are sacred space. 
You and I, we are the altar. We're the place where spirit of God and a physical body meet together. Jesus said, sacrifice you have not prepared for me, but a body you have prepared for me. You are the body of Christ, individually members of it. You don't lose your individuality. You don't lose yourself. Your true self comes forth in all of its splendor and glory in a oneness of a body, the diversity and glory of one body, one spirit, one body, one faith, one hope one baptism, one Lord, one Father of all, over all, in all, and through all. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, Pastor Ben. You are sacred space. You don't need to go look for an altar. It's right here. Spend time with it. We've got the word in Scripture of flesh and body mixed up as the same thing. It's not the same thing. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, made holy, not by your works of righteousness, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit who indwells the temple. You are the temple. Every temple, whether it's the Garden of Eden or later the tabernacle or later the temple that Solomon built or later the one that Herod was giving oversight to, were prototypes of the temple that was to come. You are it. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God dwells in you in bodily form. Folks, this is, this is incredible. That the divine that created everything from which all matter moves and exists lives in you and me. Oh my goodness, what an altar. What a place of encounter. What a place of love and intimacy. You know, I have been married for 40 years. And if my intimacy hasn't grown in 40 years, then I'm a hopeless case. I'm a lousy husband. Sometimes I am, to be honest with you. But I've got a wife who loves me. I've got Jesus who loves me, right? He doesn't give up. We sang it this morning. He doesn't give up on us. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to abandon us. He even says to the Old Testament saints, he said, even if a mother would leave her child, I will not, I cannot leave you. Oh, what love it is. What love it is. You are loved You are accepted. Start accepting yourself. Start accepting yourself. Stop being your critic. And we're some of us are critics of our body. You know, I could be so easily a critic of my body, and I do sometimes whine to it because it aches me sometimes, gives me troubles. But my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this body, even though it may go in the ground and it may become part of the food chain, it's not done with. It's not done with. Up from the grave, he arose. And up from the grave will you arise if you're dead. And if you're alive, you will be caught up with the glory that comes down to earth. And then, then you will be, need, be realizing that you are the sacred space. That you are the place where God has put his name and his glory. You, John Doe, you. My body may not be all that I would like it to be. But this body somehow, somehow, I don't know how, but I know this, it's coming out of the grave. It's coming out of the grave. The grave can't hold it. You know, one of the prophets, I think it was Elisha, he had the double portion or whatever. They buried him. Some years later, 
I don't know if they lost the headstone or whatever. They didn't know he was there. And they buried a man on top of him. And when that man hit the bones of Elisha, there was still enough spirit hanging around those bones. That man came to life. Oh, be intimate with the Holy Spirit. He is fully available to you. There's no measure on the Holy Spirit. He's the widest space in the universe, and he's in you. He's the greatest thing there is, and he's in you. He's fully alive. He does not borrow life from somewhere else. He is life. He is light. He is liberty and freedom. Oh, be intimate with the Holy Spirit. Spend time with him. Spend time with him. I'm way off my notes. Sorry, Pastor Ben. But you're sacred. I, can't, I, I, I want you to get this this morning. You are the sacred place of God. You are made for him. This is another way Paul puts it. The Lord is made for the body and the body for the Lord. It's all about a body, folks. He's going to have a body. He's going to have a body, and it's going to be yours and mine. I don't get this. I don't understand it. God is spirit but with, and lacks nothing, but he wants a body. So he created all the matter so that he could take some of it and make out of it a body. He's going to have a body. It's a romance from start to finish. It's a love story. It's from which all love stories and love songs have ever been written. They're inspired by this love story. It's a love story. He will have a bride for himself. And just so that that bride in waiting wouldn't get too lonely, he laid him to sleep and he took from his side a woman. He made man somewhat like him but not him. And he made woman somewhat like, somewhat like the man but not the man. Thank you, Jesus, for making the woman. Wow. You are an incredible creator. Come on, guys. Come on. You should be shouting hallelujah. Or singing it like Michael was earlier. And it's all because. By the way, do you know this? The woman was not made on the sixth day. She was made on the eighth day because she is the bride. She represents the bride of Christ, the new creation. That's us. Now, I don't really understand being called a bride. I mean, I don't wear dresses. I tried that when I was a kid. They laughed at me. They poked all kinds of fun at me, so I gave up wearing dresses. But I'm a bride. You're the bride, and we're dressed in glory. And I'm not waiting for that glory. I have that glory now. I'm living in that glory now. I'm telling this body, you have glory on you. You're already dressed as a bride. Because when John saw her, he said, oh, she's prepared. She's prepared for her husband. It's a love story. We present our body alive. I'm just going to give you my points because I can tell the music has started. My time is gone again. You know, I'm a Newfoundlander. We used to preach for hours. And the church got empty. Anyway. <laughs> We're no longer living for ourselves. It's a living sacrifice. It's not a dead one. Let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and go forward to maturity, not laying again and again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, and God permitting, we will, by the living sacrifice that leads to life. The world is looking for us. She may not know it, but she's looking for us. She's looking for what God has put in us. She's the answer to the longing of every human heart spirit. They're looking for it. And folks, I believe that the church is on the threshold. She's on the threshold. Thank God for the hundreds of years of what we've been doing, but I think we're on the tr threshold of the prayer of Jesus being answered. Father, I pray 
that you would make them one as we are one, that the world may know, that the world may know. And John said, how the world will know, first and foremost, is you, the new creation. Let me finish with this. In the Genesis story, God takes six days. Now, you might believe they're not 24 hours. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. God took some time and he made a place. And then he created the man and put him in that place, a home, if you will. But in the New Testament, God first creates the man. When I say man, it's all inclusive, all inclusive of male and female. He made the man first. We are what? The new creation in Christ Jesus. The day is coming. He's going to make the place for us. In fact, he even told us, I'm going away to make a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And when he comes back, the first thing of the glory of God that we see is bodies that went into the ground as seed and rose again and come up out of the ground. And those who are alive are caught up. And the glory of God comes first through us. And then he creates a new heaven and a new earth, a place. Because the old earth and the old heaven can't contain the glory of the second order, which is really the first order. So I want you to know your sacred space. I want you to know you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And what we're doing is taking those spiritual blessings that are in heavenly places and bringing them to earthly places. And we are the dispensers of that. Let's go to the world. Let's tell the world. Let's sing Get the world singing a new song. Amen, Pastor Ben? Thank you. Let heaven and earth join in one song, a chorus of hope. Let heaven and earth join in one song, a chorus of hope. Sing that again. Make it your prayer. Let heaven and earth join in one song, a chorus of hope. Let the world sing a new song. Let the world sing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, Pastor Cliff, thank you so much for bringing that word today. And may we be living sacrifices, that we would be altars of encounter, encountering his presence, that we would then be able to encounter the world with the presence of God, being the hands and the feet, get our shoes ready. I love that, Pastor Cliff. Thank you so much for that word today. Yeah, let's show our appreciation to Pastor Cliff. We're going to dismiss, so hang on. But if you are watching online, hit Next Steps. If you're new to church, stop by Next Steps over here. 
And again, the membership's happening at one o'clock. Let's just pray together. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the goodness of your presence as we've gathered. We just sense you, Lord, and pray your blessing on each one as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, First Assembly. Have an amazing day.